planning and zoning to order. Would you rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Board Secretary, could you please read the roll? Chairwoman Spidell? Yes, ma'am. Vice Chairman Richardson? Here. Secretary Grant? Here. Member Porter? Here. Member Rice? Here. Member Aton? Here. Member Riley? Here. Alternate Member Faison? Here. Alternate Member Child? Here. There are seven regular members um, and two alternates present. Um, Please note, Mr. Childs, would you like to be the alternate? Um, we don't, really don't need an alternate, but if you would please remember that all alternates are able to ask questions and participate in the discussion. Yes? Okay. Thank you. Approval of the minutes, please. Do we have action? I'll make a motion. We approve the minutes of October 20. Are there any additions or corrections? Second. Roll call, please. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Rice? Yes. Chairwoman Spido? Yes. Thank you. Um, are there any quasi-judicial staff? Are, is there any quasi-judicial business before the board? Yes, there is. Can you read the rules of participation? The quasi-judicial confirmation procedure states that the following items are subject to quasi-judicial rules of procedure. Anyone wishing to speak on any of these items must first sign a public hearing agenda card and sign the oath contained thereon. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the planning and zoning to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Submit these exhibits to the recording secretary. As for the overall agenda notice, all persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must fill out an oath card to be heard on that agenda item and sign the oath contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to the council chamber or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance to the procedure adopted in resolution number 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first, those opposed will be heard second, and those who wish to make a public comment on the item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side for or against may cross-examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Please submit such exhibits to the recording secretary. Thank you very much. Does anyone need to disclose communication or substance of contact? I see none. Thank you very much. Staff, new business? Yes, so the first item is for a cell tower CUP, which begins on page seven, the agenda. Would you guys take a second to get there? All right, so <clears throat> the CUP is for the placement of a 190 foot 199-foot communication tower located at 15 Eidnick Avenue. Section 228-220 requires the placement of a cell tower through the, uh, through the review of a CUP. The cell tower replaced the previous tower that's located on a city water tower that will soon be demolished. Um, a temporary cell tower was approved by a council in December of 2020 while the applicant searched for a permanent location, which is um, what is before you all tonight. So as you can see, the 
Which one do you turn on the laser? It doesn't matter. The doesn't matter. Based on the zoning map, it is located in the M1 zoning district with surrounding um, industrial um, zoning. And um, the two proposed towers to the right of that, I'll discuss that in a bit. So staff does recommend approval of the tower. Um, of course, council may impose additional conditions um, along with uh, condition, recommendations that were made by the Historic Preservation Board. So I'll briefly go over those uh, conditions. Uh, for staff, uh, recommend a minimum five feet of landscape screening in front of the proposed high security fence where the property fronts Inig Avenue. Um, the Historic Preserva Preservation Board's recommendations is to paint the tower sky blue color, um, which blends in with the background, uh, background sky. And number two, the antenna, antenna configuration on the tower um, be a flush mount which is uh, the antennas close to the tower and um, as opposed to the full head frame uh, wide out configuration. So that's basically what you're seeing with the two towers. The applicant proposed the uh, wide out configuration uh, to the left and the historic preservation board recommended the flush tower, which gives it that thicker look um, for on the pole. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be able to answer any questions. Clark, are there any cards on this item, please? Uh, I don't have any cards. Okay, no. Okay. And so, do we have um, any commissioners have a question on this item? You the applicant? Good evening, I'm Matt Tanaya John, and I will have a presentation. I don't know if you want to complete your questions before you hear my applicant's presentation. Let's hear your application, please. All right. And I do have speaker cards complete. Um, yes, please. Marvelous, thank you. So good evening, I'm Matt Tanaya John, 935 Main Street, Suite D1, Safety Harbor, Florida, 34695. I come before you today with staff recommendation of approval uh, for a 199 foot tall monopole style communication tower to be located at 15 Imig Avenue. I also have Craig O'Neill with T-Mobile with me. Uh, he's an RF engineer for T-Mobile, should you have any questions on their need. The parent parcel is developed um, as a small building that had its last uh, business tax receipt as a office for construction build for a construction company and an open space on the north end of the lot. I'm now showing you an aerial um, of the general vicinity around the monopole uh, in this aerial up is north and you can see the street grid for Titusville. The green marker in the approximate middle right is the location of the monopole. To the north, there are commercial property, then Garden Street. To the south is M2 Heavy Industrial. To the east are M1 Light Industrial and M2 Heavy Industrial. There's a concrete plant, and then the FEC Main Line. To the west are Einig Avenue, then Light Industrial and Mixed Uses. Uh, when you look at this, the area is generally developed with industrial uses, with office commercial uses um, along Einig, I mean, along Garden Street. There's one residentially zoned property that exists as a standalone spot to the northwest. As we zoom in closer, and this yellow uh, arrow is pointing to the tower. As we zoom in closer, you just get a closer view of what's going on again up is north. The green marker is the monopole, but what also becomes more visible is that there is urban canopy in the area off-site that helps break up uh, the view sheds. And then this is the closest view. You heard the parcel is zoned uh, M1 industrial. Communication towers are allowable through the conditional use process. We do have a separate variance request for setbacks and landscaping and fences that will come before the board, the BAA, in December. These are just your zoning and future land use maps. Okay, when I'm describing a monopole style communication tower, I'm describing a type of tower that has one support pole with no external. Um, 
with external antennas mounted on a head frame, but no guy wires or iron works extending out from it. Um, this minimizes the overall visual profile. Uh, this one actually has the uh, dull gray finish that's natural to the galvanized steel that's used. Um, and then they are this model pole will be completely dark at night. The model pole will be located in the, uh, closer to the center of the lot. This is sheet C1 from the plans. This maximizes separation in all directions and will be enclosed by a chain link fence with lock gates. The monopole will host T-Mobile. As you heard from your staff, this is the replacement um, installation uh, for a previous co-location that they had on the city water tank. So they're not trying to bring a new, um, new installation into the city. They're trying to restore coverage from an old one. Currently, um, they have what's called a cell on wheels or cow. You may remember that I came before you last December on that. Um, per triaging the situation with continuity coverage. That's a smaller area of coverage with less capacity offload than what the final deployment that'll be on uh, this monopole will provide. This is just a, um, this is sheet C2 and it just shows the compound and then it shows the monopole, this elevation. Uh, the monopole will be designed for four co-locations. This one shows three, but it will be four. Uh, the big change is that DISH is becoming a carrier in its own right. That's part of an FCC mandate, but it's actually materializing. So the industry is switching back to a four co-location setup. Just to run through photo simulations real quick. The first view is from Garnet Street looking southeast, and you can see that uh, almost the entirety of the monopole is um, buffered by the existing vegetation in the background, and the vegetation in the foreground would be more than capable of buffering it completely. This is Sim 2 from Garden Street at Maiden Lane looking east, and you can see at this distance the base of the monopole is buffered, and the vegetation in the midground is capable of buffering a half to two thirds of it. This is Sim 3 from Titus Street looking south. And again, you can see that the base of the monopole is buffered. You can see the urban canopy in the area is able to buffer, um, such as that tree over to the right at the um, power pole is able to, would be able to buffer half of the monopole. You can also see that from a size perspective um, with width and everything is starting to look more like the power line in the background there. This is Sim 4 from Canaveral. And you can see again, the base of the monopole is buffered by the urban canopy. And you can see that cabbage palm off to the right, which isn't a very tall tree, is able to buffer at least a half of that monopole. And then this is M5 from Garden Street. Again, you can see the base is buffered. Um, again, from width perspective, it's a similar width um, profile as what you would see to other utility structures in the area. Moving on to RF need. Uh, this monopole serves two functions, and that's to restore coverage and restore capacity to the area from that was uh, removed when a city water tank was removed, or when was decommissioned. T-Mobile's already off of it, so for T-Mobile's purposes, it's removed, even though it's still standing. Uh, you heard the cow on the um, cell on wheels on the Leon is currently triaging the area. And so this will offload capacity strain from neighboring towers. Towers are like roads. So we play the same concurrency game um, as carriers play the same concurrency game that local governments play. Can we keep up with the ever increasing demand? Um, they can only handle so much traffic. So um, as they get burdened, they function less and less until they reach full capacity and then you can't connect to them. Uh, this is important because a significant gap can arise from a lack of capacity. The FCC actually step, uh, weighed in on this in Order 18-133, um, paragraphs 37 through 40. Where they were saying that a lack of capacity is a gap, just as sure as if you don't have any signal, because if you can't connect to the tower, it doesn't matter how strong the signal is, you still don't have a connection. The height of the monopole is driven by the coverage area. So basically, the shorter that you go, the less it covers, and it also changes the handoff characteristics. Uh, the cow that was approved was 102 feet tall, uh, and that was 30 feet shorter than the water tank co-location. So just to get um, even with the water tank, you would have a minimum of 132, and that's before you account for the shift east. TLO Mobile is co-located to the north, uh, northwest. You can see that on this map here. There are red dots. 
on this map, uh, in this map up is north. The green areas are reliable coverage. The yellow areas are reliable only for in-vehicle coverage. Um, the red markers are existing T-Mobile towers. So you can see that they're located to the north-northwest, to the west out by I-95, and then to the south. And then you can see the monopole added there. Um, just for um, information, they did look at co-locating on the FPL tower that's to the south. It's about 200 feet tall. Unfortunately, that tower is not available to them for co-location. Just to move through housekeeping, we've provided an FAA determination of no hazard to air navigation. Your airport authority has reviewed this application and has recommended approval, determining that the monopole will not need lights. So with those two things, I can tell you that the monopole will be completely dark at night. Your Historic Preservation Board recommended approval of the monopole with two conditions. You heard from staff, paint the monopole sky blue, and perform a flush mount configuration. I'm going to go into a very short discussion about that. Um, before we go in, we will, to be clear, T-Mobile will build what the city approves, but we would like you to consider a couple of things about that. Um, the first one is we would ask you to consider recommending the monopole with the dull gray finish like what you saw in that first picture. The thought process is that it will allow the monopole to blend with a wider variety of skies. A blue sky can vary from time to time and you can end up with a blue that's more brilliant or less brilliant than your blue sky. It's kind of the thought process that's, you can kind of see that reflected with, for instance, the Air Force and Navy. They have gray jets, not blue jets. Um, so we would ask you to consider that. If you do decide to uphold the Historic Planning Board's uh, recommendation, then we would just ask that you direct the staff group to give us a paint chip um, on what sky blue they would, what sky blue the city would like. We don't want to play. We would ask that we not be made to play Groundhog Day with a paint crew that has to climb the tower and repaint it. If people say, "Well, that's not the right sky blue," the other thing we would ask you to consider um, would be recommending the monopole with its full head frame. And when I say full head frame, um, the type of head frame that's actually being uh, proposed is the smallest version of full head frames. There's different models that are manufactured and some are wider than others. Um, but the reason that they would ask you to do that is because a modern co-location that's densified, like what T-Mobile's going to propose and like what your carriers are using in urban environments like this require three antennas per side. It's a triangular top called sectors. So you end up with nine antennas up there. Um, if you go to the flush mount configuration where they place a crossbar directly against the tower and put the antennas on that, you can only hold two antennas per sector, which means now instead of taking up one level, a co-location needs two levels on the tower. So it ends up with a trade-off where, um, and this is just an example of a bright blue against a lighter sky. But you end up with this trade-off where either you have wider head frames with a smaller portion of the tower covered, or you have the flush mount with a larger portion of the tower covered. So it's really a question of smooth profile for trading extra width and more smooth profile versus narrower width and a little more cluttered profile. Um, there are operational trade-offs, though, as well. So in addition to covering more of the tower with equipment, um, the supporting equipment at the top, the remote radio units and other computing devices that make the antennas work, normally those would be mounted behind the antennas on that full head frame. But when you have the flush mount, there's no room for that. So those antennas are mounted, those remote radio units and other equipment are mounted directly, they're bandaged directly to the support pole, the monopole itself, um, in between and below the antennas, and you can kind of see that here. I wish I had a zoom function for you. This doesn't show it the best, but you can see that there's stuff you can, hopefully you can see that there's things in between, but you end up with that. But operationally, the, the most impactful thing for the city's purpose is that um, once you do that, the service technicians, whenever they have to service the top side of the tower, they can't just climb the tower and run ropes down and hoist equipment up, you have to actually bring a crane in and put crew in a basket on the end of the crane and bring them up to the top. 
So um, with that, you know, you would likely see whenever they had to change out antennas or equipment up top, you'd have to MOT, put an MOT in place on Einig Avenue and have a crane set up there to service that tower. Um, so we would submit that if, if you do allow it, we would submit that you consider that, consider the full head frame, if only from an operational standpoint, because it does allow a more invisible maintenance for the purpose of the city uh, than having to take and bring in a crane and close, I, close part of INIG and put people on the end of the crane. So um, again, T-Mobile will construct what the city uh, approves, but we would ask that you consider that. Moving on um, for the rest of housekeeping, to my knowledge, no members of the public have submitted comments or inquiries to staff group, and I've received no comments or inquiries at my office. Um, I can go through the conditional use elements if you'd like, or in the interest of time, I'll defer to uh, your staff's report, uh, whatever you would prefer. And with that, I reserve remaining time for rebuttal, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I have a question to staff, though. Um, before I call on um, Mr. Richardson, is is the public um, has public notice been? Does the community have input on this, <clears throat> and has that been done? Do, do they have to have? Does that is that a requirement? So yeah, with any CUP, there has to be signs that are posted, which have been posted for the CUP hearing. And there That's, was no was there a community meeting or what's the procedure is, there? A community engagement reading, meeting is required for rezonings, comprehensive plan amendments, master plans, and a development agreement. That is not this. Okay. So, so community, so you don't have to have one. Okay. And so you mentioned before, before you shut off that, um, that you had not received any notice from the community. So there was signage posted. Is that correct? And nobody called you? Correct. So... Okay. The, the notice has gone out to my understanding. Um, I've received no comments or inquiries or anyone calling me about it. Um, and to my understanding, staff has not received any inquiries either. So, Is it easy for the public to make a call? Do they know who to call? I mean, on the signs, there, there is the number posted for the city. And um, typically, whenever we do get inquiries, it is based off the sign or a letter in the mail that they receive. So, yes, it is. And what's, how, how big is the sign? Is it one of those 9 by 10 signs? It's one of those neons. In this case, it's an orange neon sign that's posted right on the property where it fronts INIG. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Richardson. I have a couple of questions. I remember when you came here before and brought up the subject of the temporary tower on wheels. And it mm -hmm. was located at the Leon and Brown or somewhere in that area. Does this mean with this tower you'll take that tower on wheels and locate it somewhere else? Correct. Um, once the monopole is constructed and brought on air, and when they're able to turn the antennas on, um, because they have their CO from the city, they will dismantle the cow and it will go away. And the second question is, have you had any experience with painting your towers a blue? A sky blue, because I have a couple of concerns. So I have, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that the vast majority, probably 90% of my practice has been cell towers. Um, and that's been that way since I graduated law school in 2013. I was trained by an attorney who did cell towers. This is what I do. I've probably been attached to 200 projects in the eight years that I've been practicing law. You will be my first blue cell tower if you approve this with that condition. Mr. Wheelis. I'm, I'm kind of oh, concerned sorry. about painting it blue. I know this sounds silly, but I'm afraid that birds would run into it since it's blue. If it's gray, they'll see it and take a detour. But if it's painted blue, how many birds do we have the chance of killing by painting it blue? I realize that it looks better in the environment, 
but it might be damaging to the birds. Just a thought. I'd like to say something about the blue. Um, I've been to Lowe's and Home Depot. That's quite a lot of blues to choose from, right? Just a comment, but I do have, if you, the, the historic board has asked you or stipulated that you paint it a shade of blue, but has not stipulated what shade of blue. Is that correct? Correct. Um, so if you want to, so if you want to go back to your gunmetal gray color, which is your typical paint job, um, do you have to go before the historic preservation board again? Um, my understanding of the process, and I will ultimately defer to your staff group, is that when it comes to conditions of approval, your city council will have the final say on what conditions are upheld and what conditions are not upheld. So today we're discussing recommendations, and I would hope that your recommendation would be to approve it with a gray as the gunmetal gray with um, the full head frame. But ultimately, it's going to be your city council that makes the final decision. Staff, does that have to be part of the condition? Um, the summary was correct that the chain of approvals goes from TEC to this body to then city council. So you may act on TEC's recommendations. You may decide. It's historic. I'm sorry, historic board. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, you may act on those recommendations. You may choose to not include those recommendations that the historic board had recommended, um, or you could modify them. Thank you. Um, Member Wheelis. I've got a. No, oh, you're on BAA. He's a member of BAA. Get yeah. me straight technology wise. Excuse me. I think Mr. Rice was next anyway. No, Miss Riley's where I know Miss Riley. All right. I did chime in. That might be me. Let me undo it. Are you are you operating under a different name? <laughs> oh. Okay, excuse me. So I've got my light on, too. You're just confusing me, okay? Why is it still on that side? Sorry. Is that all the public sees is that side? So this is me. I'm sorry. I can move the side oh, okay. to whatever you would like, um, or we could. Are you done with the Yes, I have nothing else substantive to show on here. Okay. okay. I'm going to go to... I was next. I You're next. You're not on there anymore. All right. This Mr. You've got to go by your official name here. I'll wait. Okay. Nope. You, you can go now. Okay. Mr. Rice. I just want to clarify one thing that you said, and I want to make sure I heard it right. The FAA and the airport authority said there will not be a light on a 199-foot tower. Is that a correct statement? Correct. There will not be a light. It will be completely dark at night. Hmm. Okay. Mr. Raton. I, I think that's right. Um, I have a question for staff. Okay. I know in all site development plans um, that you have a development, you're required to put sidewalks in on local roads. Why isn't that a condition? So there is a sidewalk at across the street on Inig Avenue, but as far as the sidewalk, but not on that side of the street. That is correct. I just know if I was coming in and doing a site development, you would require me to put a sidewalk there. Just wondering why. May I be heard? This lot has legacy platting from before your zoning code. Um, it's very old, and the lot's 47 feet wide, so there isn't a lot to work with. Um, we could try to go pull up a Google Street View, but I don't know if a sidewalk would clear the existing structure that's on the property. Um, but it, it's, it's a tight fit as far I, it's as... It's just in the code. Understood. Okay. Um, the other thing, staff, is, is the building that they're putting this behind it will still be... 
usable? Is that a correct statement? Correct. It will actually have a fence in between the facility, the structure, or the structure and the facility okay. and the building itself. I know it's vacant now. It was a professional office at one time, construction office, I think is what, what you indicated. Does this affect the parking count at all by taking away that area that looked like it was that used for a lay down yard because it was a construction office or parking? Will it affect the use of that building, limiting the use of that building in the future? So the office was, uh, the access to the office was off of Orange and the parking, I believe, I, I, that's why I want to check with the, okay, no the maps. I can get back to you, but I want to say that the office of parking, um, the access was through Orange Avenue where the, for the cell tower, parking would be off of Einig Avenue. Okay. And um, with regard to color, my preference would be orange and blue with the big gator symbol on it, but uh, <laughs> my sister would agree. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there, but I agree with you. I don't know that painting would, would do much. Um, I agree with Member Richardson, and uh, although it's sort of surprised that the FAA is not requiring a light, I would think blue would also be a, a, an impediment to air traffic during the day if it was a perfect match to a blue sky with air, aircraft. So. That would be my concerns. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Aton. Um, this may be for staff. What's, how do you handle maintenance as whether the coating is painted or the coating's galvanized, but if the galvanized starts to rust and you've got discoloration on the tower, is that handled by an ordinance or as far as visual, you know, longevity of of it whether paint it's painted and it starts peeling or galvanized starts rusting uh how is that handled for the long term i'm honestly not sure because this would be a first um do you have it go ahead i mean this is a, sorry i'll just i'll just jump in real quick close to enough to the downtown um, area and it's on a major artery so it's going to be pretty visible so right so for visual blight something like that where a property's not being maintained and it's causing a nuisance that would be a code enforcement action okay member grant well well in my opinion if anything should be painted it should be the water tower but let's not go there it's a different story <laughs> um Tell me more about the towers, the flush mount and the uh, monopole. As, well, what I'm trying to get out here. Um, the, the flush mount seems to be more, to me at least, more wind resistant. Uh, a lot of area to catch the wind. Um, which one is the most popular? Which type, which style is more popular, uh, say for Florida? So the full head frame monopole actually outnumbers the flush mounts because right. you have the space for the equipment. So if you were to drive around Florida and tally, you'd see a lot more of those full head frame monopoles. Ironically, not that, uh, ironically, you would likely need to make the tower stronger to support the flush mount because you have the additional levels that you're putting in there for loading because right. the, the side fluctuations are more affected, the, the structure is affected more by its weight than its width at this point. Well, I definitely think that some sort of landscaping buffering should be included in, um, but as far as painting it blue or something like that, I'm, I'm not motivated one way or the other on that, unless you, like I said, take care of the water tower, but that's my story. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Member Riley. So I wasn't privy to the historical commission as to why they came up with the, I think it was sky blue. And I agree with uh, Ms. Spidell that that could be one of 20 or 30 different colors. Uh, but assuming that it was to counter what, what staff said, visual blight, um, wouldn't a better color, I believe during World War II, a lot of the towers were painted white for camouflage to, for enemy airlines and so for air, air, airplanes. Um, so 
do you have any kind of a study in your office or your company? Uh, have you ever painted a water tower before or, or a cell tower before? So I, I don't have any studies on hand for you. Let's match tonight, John, again. Um, but I have been attached to projects where we've done white flagpoles. So back before flagpoles became obsolete because you can't fit the antennas in them, um, what we would do is we construct a tower with all the antennas inside, paint it white, it'd have a gold finial on top and an American flag, and you'd light it at night. And it would look very brilliant against the blue sky because you get the pop of that white. So um, I've never been attached to a project where we've had a monopole be painted white. I have seen a couple um, down in Miami-Dade, but I have been involved with, with flagpole towers, and that white really makes it pop against the sky. I would be interested in getting some kind of an expert opinion about this because I'm, I'm not an expert on it. And, of course, there's the other consideration of uh, Member Richardson that is our intent to make it invisible, and if we do, then do we harm the birds in our city? Um, so it's, it's kind of a catch-22 there. But I would like to get the expert opinion about if we're trying to attack the visual blight, what color we, do we paint it? Because I, I understand if you paint it a blue, based on the shading at different times of the day, it would appear darker than the actual sky blue that we originally intended. So I've got a lot of questions about the color if we're, if we're going to get it painted. Uh, the, second, the second thing is, um, what about resistant to hurricane winds? What, how, what is the uh, force of the, the, the pole as far as, as that? So the, this is Matt and I, John again. The monopole will be constructed to the latest Florida Building Code, which incorporates a national code, code called the TIA Revision H Code, and that's your national standard for towers. Um, that takes care of wind resistance and making sure that everything is connected in a way that is hurricane resistant. It has to meet your local wind zone rating for where it is located. Finally, the monopole will be designed with fall zone technology, and that's actually shown if I can have my my um, PowerPoint back, please. Um, you, on sheet C2, there was a radius. Let me back up to that. Okay, so unfortunately I don't have a, a laser pointer here, but you can see in the middle there's the monopole, it's a circle, and it has the hashed marking that is the ice bridge going down to, like the cabling support going down to on the computer set at the base, and you'll see a dashed circle. That's the fall zone radius. And basically what it's designed to do is that there's a pre-engineered crimp point in the monopole. So if it were to fail, it would fold over upon itself. So it removes the lever action the wind has on the tower so it can't plunk over. And this is technology that has been around since I was a child. I have memories of going down um, I-75, I grew up over in Sarasota, Bradenton, and my father and I driving down I-75, and the interstate lampposts, which are quite tall, and they're basically the same technology, they're the same design, they just are scaled down to be lights, were folded over upon themselves. That's fall zone technology in action. And this has been designed into the vast majority of cell towers. Um, it's been almost standard uh, for as long as I've been practicing. Okay, I, I just remember 2004, practically all of the, of the commercial signage in town uh, was destroyed. And, uh, but you're saying that this is, is going to be built to a higher standard than those signs? Correct. It's designed to handle winds at altitude. Is, so. is it uh, 150 miles an hour wind, or do you know? I don't know your exact wind zone. Um, if you'd like, I can look it up, but it will comply with, by virtue of the Florida Building Code, it will comply with the wind zone rating for its location. So if the wind zone is 150 miles an hour, it will comply with that. Yeah, I would appreciate getting that information because a lot of us here have homes and, and we're familiar with wind speeds and hurricanes and we just like to have the reassurance that that tower isn't going to fall over. And I appreciate what you said about 
the thing uh, falling in on itself so that it, apparently it's not going to damage a 190 foot radius of uh, buildings nearby, correct? That is correct. So it's it's designed to be completely contained on the parent parcel. Now, what about the planes from, we have a small uh, commercial airport, Dunn Air Park. Yes. Uh, nearby. It's not that far away from, from where you're uh, going to build this. Uh, is there any danger to those planes taking off or, or landing the 199-foot tower? No, there shouldn't be. And your airport, your airport board had a say in that. They reviewed this and they determined it didn't need lighting and they recommended approval. Okay, and then the final question had, has to do with uh, the staff is recommending a vegetative barrier. Staff, uh, uh, Navelle, is that for the entire perimeter or is it just part of the perimeter? For that recommendation specifically, it will be just for that, uh, the, right of, uh, the property where it fronts Idnick Avenue. Okay, so that's the um, the western border. Correct. Okay, and when you said vegetative barrier, uh, would that include trees or not necessarily? It have to follow the requirements per the uh, high security fence. There is requirements for uh, vegetative landscaping in addition to a high security fence, so it would have to meet those requirements. I would have to look specifically what those vegetative requirements are. Okay, could you possibly bring that information back then sure. about uh, whether or not uh, the requirement for, I think you said a five foot vegetative barrier on the west side of that property, if that would include trees, that's my question, or would it include bushes, or what, what exactly is that? And that, that's all the questions I have, thank you. Understood. And if I may, for the benefit of the record, um, we do agree to staff's proposed condition of approval to put that vegetated buffer on the western side. I apologize for not including that in my primary presentation. Member Faison, please. Good afternoon. <clears throat> well, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. I believe staff and many of the commissioners did a great job of asking questions. Uh, when it comes to the color of the poll, uh, you made a great point with saying that, that the Navy and the Air Force both use that color gray without any incidents. And so congratulations on that. Uh, but one of the questions that was in here was about nuisance. And that uh, my question is only in regards to the cell tower producing uh, interference with other electronics in the area. Um, is there any risk of that happening? No, sir. Um, this is Matt Nye, John again. Um, T-Mobile is licensed by the FCC, um, and in order to maintain that licensure, they're not allowed to interfere with other bands, and the FCC polices that. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. I have Craig O'Neill. He is an RF engineer with T-Mobile, and he can come up and give sworn testimony to that if you'd like to hear that, sir. No, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. But the, the next question that I have also is that you had showed that with the placement of this tower, there'll be additional coverage. So when we're talking uh, about... Um, Flush mounted versus the other the, the other form, does that impact coverage of the area? Because there were some areas that uh, were not being covered by the addition of this pole. I don't believe it will impact coverage. Um, it will impact maintenance, but not co not coverage. To my understanding, let me double check with Mr. O'Neill. Am I correct, Mr. O'Neill? Would you like? Um, is, is and, um, if you're going to more than. Yes or no, I'd like you to come up, please. All right. Please state Mr. Your name O'Neill, can you state your name, please? Yes. Uh, Craig O'Neill. I'm with uh, T Mobile Engineering, uh, address 14514 Graydale Circle, Orlando. Um, basically, uh, if we do flush mount, we'll probably have to, instead of having the antennas side by side, we'll have to have them uh, up and down. And the the lower antenna will probably be a little bit lower in height, so that could potentially uh, impact coverage slightly. Um, whereas if they were at the same height, they would have more of the same shot out, so to speak. 
Does that answer your question, Mr. Faison? It does. It does. Okay. Thank you. Because uh, one of the areas I was concerned about was the, the Leon target area um, and whether that, that area gets full coverage or not. Uh, and on that map, it looked as though it was kind of spotty in some areas. And so I want to make sure that the De Leon target area gets full coverage just as the rest of the city does. Thank you. Mr. Porter, please. Member Porter. Okay, thank you for your um, presentation. In your presentation, you said there are three existing towers, one to the north, one to the west, and one to the south. What color are those? I can pull up Google Earth and find out real quick if you'd like. So. They're not blue, though. Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Okay, so I would recommend we keep them the same color. <laughs> Member Childs. Yeah, um, I think I've seen some cell towers where they're like uh, decorated as like trees or somewhere like disguised as trees. Um, and I guess this would probably be a weird place to put a tree because it would be the only tree there. But I, I, do you guys ever do that where you make them look like trees or something or somewhat disguise them? This is Matt and I, John again. And it's funny that you say that because 9 a.m. tomorrow I have a hearing before the Collier County Planning Commission to discuss a 147 foot tall tree. Um, they, have, um, they, they have the benefit of um, a lot more urban canopy than you have. So right. it adds a lot more context to it. Um, so those are very effective, um, a very effective camouflage in the right circumstances. Right, probably not this one, but yeah, I agree. I think the gray is great. Thank you. Thank you. Member Riley. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, Ms. Johns, I have another question. Um, just a clarification about this head frame. So the full head frame is easier to maintain with less disruption to the neighborhood, i.e. hire a crane, close the street, et cetera, et cetera. This is Matt Nia John. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, but go ahead. So that's an, a yes, so that's the full head? Yes. Okay. What was the, clarify what the recommendation was from the Historic Preservation Board. They wanted a different kind of head? So they wanted the antennas flush mounted um, against the pole. So that would be like what we showed you with the side-by-side -side diagram where it's narrower. Okay. Additional comments from membership. Um, Staff. Chairwoman, I just wanted to answer your question, Member Riley. Yes. Per section 30-183, it states that for the high security fence, a, um, the, a continuous hedge shall run along the entire length of the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong section. A continuous hedge shall run along the entire length of the fence Said hedge shall may be maintained at least um, a height of 36 inches. One tree shall be planted every 40 feet along the entire length of the fence. How long is that? Uh, how, how long is the uh, expanse of the vegetative barrier? Is the, it, is so it 40 feet long? The, it's 132 feet. Oh, okay, so you have, what, three, maybe three trees? Correct. Okay, thank you. Staff, Member Riley had another question concerning, or maybe she had it to, to, to you, concerning research on color. Um, my apologies. I lost this is Match Night John again. Um, I have been trying to pull up my tablet, and it's not, compl it's not playing right now. So I can't even give you pictures of a white tower against the blue sky at the moment. If you allow me to plug my tablet in, I can pull that up. And would you please remind me of the section of code that you would like to hear more on? Or was that addressed by staff with um, their answers? On well, the he, he, ex he answered the question about the vegetative barrier, but um, I had a question about the some expert information regarding color of that tower. I would not be able to provide that tonight. Um, I would be, uh, it, it, 
the closest thing we could do would be to provide photo simulations. So we would have to con you would have to continue the hearing, and then we would come back before you and present photo simulations showing a tower that is white or different colors. Um, I do have pictures of existing towers. If you allow me to plug my tablet in, um, I can get it back running. I'll have to grab my power cord out of my car, unfortunately. Um, but I can show you real world examples of what a white tower would look like against a blue sky. I would like to see that. Yeah. Okay. I will need a few minutes to go get the power cord and plug in if that's okay. I don't know if you want to. Three minutes, five minutes. How fast are you? <laughs> I'm a ballroom dancer, so I can actually run uh, on heels. Three minutes. Uh, three minutes. Let and, me. And one turn at the door. Okay. Can you do that, please? Let me go get that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chairman, should we just go on to the next item and then come back to this one? We could, or we could take a three minute and a turn break. You want to do that? I think we need to stay on the topic.
Would the board come back to order, please? Thank you, Ms. John. And thank you. This is Matt Nia John again. Um, my planner emailed pictures of um, various white uh, flagpole style communication towers to Naviel, and he is kindly putting them on screen for you now. So here's an example of a flagpole tower which has been painted white, and it's against a variety of sky, sky colors actually. So you can see a pretty deep blue up towards the top of the sky, and you can actually see some graying of the sky from various clouds, and you can see that it stands out against it. One of the nice things about painting a tower white is that it does create a very clean insulation that has pop when you are doing a flagpole style communication tower. So back in the days when we could do flagpoles, I, I miss them a lot actually. Um, you know, occasionally you would see a US flag on a gray flagpole and that just didn't look the same as having it on a white flagpole. May we please advance um, one picture? Is that possible from here? Okay, our background. Will. Will? Would it be possible to scroll one picture? Okay. And members of the commission, I do want to let you know that this is on Agenda Star. So if you guys want to have a closer look, you are able to open that up in front of you guys. Thank you. Three of them should say compound photos, and the last one should say East Lake flagpole. Okay. And this is actually a flagpole that's down the road from where I live. And you can see it against gray sky there, and you can see it popping. So, I, word pop, you mean stand out? Yes, my apologies for, for oh, the colloquialism. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I'm thinking that the popping out part of it, which I now agree with you, is probably not what the Historical Commission was thinking. So. I'm thinking that they were thinking of trying to blend it into the environment. But I don't know because I wasn't at it at the meeting. Understood. And in all fairness to them, that's white. Um, blue being mismatched with the sky would be more like the water tower that I showed you earlier. So, But you asked about a white tower. Right. Do you have any additional questions, Ms. Riley? Uh, no, but uh, okay. I thank uh, Danny Aiden for giving me that 140, 140 miles 143, per hour. 143. Yeah, 143 miles per hour. Mr. Aiden, do you need to make that all on the record? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, page thank you. 27, 132 in the bottom left corner. Um, there's, the design criteria was 143 mile per hour, ultimate with a three second gust and 110 nominal with a three second gust and it says it's in accordance with florida building code of 2020. all right so that that's that's pretty impressive if that's being designed to that um level of whatever um, and plus the fact that it collapses on itself that that's those are good things thank you thank you does that satisfy your questions Ms. riley Yes. Thank you, Mr. Aton. Um, Mr. Rice. Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion. Um, does I, that, uh, does any other member have any additional question? We've got to close the public hearing. First. Okay. So that's the closure of the hearing. And Mr. Rice would like to make a motion. Yes, I'm going to uh, make a, a motion for approval with the following three conditions. The first is the condition that staff provide a five foot landscape bu yard buffer in front of the proposed high security fence of the property fronts uh, Enig Avenue. The second one is that it has to meet all required LDRs. So if it sidewalks are required, then it has to meet all, all LDRs. And the third is that the existing site that the approval at staff level does not make the existing property more non-conforming or have a new non-conformity. Do you understand what I'm saying, staff? Okay, because we can't make something more non-conforming because something was built. So those are my three conditions. 
Can I, can I just ask with regards to the non-conforming, do you have a specific conforming uh, conformity issue that you? I don't know that there is one, okay. but let's say parking, this impacted parking didn't make parking count work for the existing structure. That would be, and not, now that structure will be non-conforming. Okay, and I'm just saying there might be things because it's an old structure that are currently non-conforming. We have to live with those, but we can't make anything more non-conforming or something that's new non-conforming. Sorry to jump in. Again, one more question about your first condition with regards to the additional uh, five-foot buffer. It's the staff's recommendation. Staff's recommendation. Oh, okay. So you weren't, I thought you were asking for an additional five. Okay. No, 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 it's, it's exactly what I got it. That staff is. So those are my three conditions of approval. I, I would second the motion if another one is included <clears throat> that allows the applicant <clears throat> to build a full headset. I totally agree. I, that's why I didn't make it a condition because I didn't want to limit that to not be the full head. Well, does the applicant think it should be stated? Um, this is Matt Tanaya John again. If it is the pleasure of the board to state it as a condition, we would appreciate that, yes. I'll accept it. Second motion. Discussion, please, and I'd like to add, does the color have to be conditioned in this? No. Do we recognize the the recommendation? If this body does not provide a condition regarding the color, then there's no going to there's not going to be a condition regarding the color applied to the uh, application. Thank you very much. So there is there's a recommendation plus a second. Any additional discussion? Just my general discussion that it would appear that the tower being gray does not really is not detrimental to the scenery and the bicycle and bike uh, ridge does detriment is detrimental to the scenery because it's so rusty i just point that out and that's less than a block away I'm going to call for a vote to roll call, please. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Secretary Grant? No. Member Rice? Yes. Chairwoman Spidell? Yes. You want to know my reasons for saying no? I think we're making too much out of it. I really do. I think, personally, I think um, proper landscaping. Um, buffer would be would be uh, ideal as far as um, painting it different colors and stuff like that I uh, yeah I'm sorry I'm, I'm not motivated by that at all oh well okay and some of the other things that you mentioned there it really uh, had a hard time understanding what you were saying I guess it's because of my lack of experience but this seems to me that we're making too much of it so you're clear Member Grant, that that color is not a stipulation anymore. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, passes. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss John. And thank you for your time. Thank you. We will go to item number IRCN ordinance, please, staff. All right, so this item begins on page 60 of the agenda. I'll let you guys take a moment to get there. So this is following a request for a BTR that was approved for medical office use, but was later denied as a zoning verification letter um, as a social services use in the IRCN zoning district. Because of that zoning verification letter, the city did receive a letter indicating that the interpretation of the social services use could be um, could be discriminatory under the Americans with Dis with uh, Disabilities Act. So um, this is the way to essentially resolve that um, that interpretation. And if we could have that ordinance pulled up, I could show you guys exactly where the language in the code. 
would be. I take that back. So if you guys scroll down to page 62 of the agenda. You'll see under section 28-21, the Indian River City Neighborhood Zoning for non-conforming uses, the strike through um, for counseling. That is essentially the, um, the issue at hand and just to remove that language for counseling for uh, non-conforming uses. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Are there cards on this item, please? No. Discussion with membership? Mr. Richardson. Yes, I have a concern and talked to Brad about it. There isn't a, lo <clears throat> a location map regarding 4320 South Hopkins. We should have a location map in the packet. Is there something that staff could show us, please? So you're asking about that specific yes. location. So we do have on your y'all's agenda star, we do have the IRCN zoning map, but we can, um, I can grab a screenshot of that um, location and throw it on agenda star if you guys want to give me a yes. second to do so. I cool. think that should always be included in the packet when we're talking about a specific site. While you're looking for that, please, <clears throat> Mr. Rice, do you have a comment, please? No, I'll, I'll wait for his answer. And, and okay. I have a different subject. No problem. While Navael is pulling that up, this is a zoning change for the zoning category, not a specific parcel and for this one the IRCN is compact in one particular part of the city Navail is going to pull that up for you but for many other zoning categories they're spread out all over the city the letter from the attorney specifically points out 4320 South Hopkins The letter does specify one particular address, but the zoning change is for the entire IRCN commercial zoning category. And as such, your decision will be based on the zoning category um, results rather than the one particular property that you may be looking at. Navail is pulling up the code zoning map for you as we speak. He's working on it. I'm stressing him out. Why is throwing it? I can ask my pressure if you want. But, but okay. yeah, I see the it's on the, it's in the star the whole in the River City neighborhood, but there are areas of counseling as such in that entire area right now. If I'm not mistaken, what used to be Central Baptist Church on Knox McRae has a, a, an apartment complex devoted to people with addictions. In addition, um, North of Our Charities operates three different houses in that same section. This particular situation arose because a application, or I'm sorry, a request was made to the city for a zoning verification letter. And based on the information that went with that request, the zoning verification letter was denied. And this threat of litigation is a result of the denial of a zoning verification letter based on the specific set of facts that were presented to the city staff, which led to the result of the city wanting to make this zoning change to allow for counseling in this area. Well, the objection to counseling has to do with what? With specific... I'm not sure I understand your question. Specific drugs that they may administer or... 
So currently the code prohibits the category of counseling and staff and city attorney's office agree that the word counseling should be omitted from the list of things that is currently in the ordinance. If that makes sense. Members of the commission, I just want to point out that if you all um, do look in the agenda star, you're able to see the 40 the 20 South Hopkins Avenue, um, the specific location. It's right south of Coquina Avenue on the west side of Hopkins Avenue. Let me clarify this. This is for a zone, but not for this particular site. It's Am for I the entire zoning category, this ordinance. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so it's not specific to the address on that site. Right, I was just answering okay, Mr. Richardson's thank question you. Yes, specifically thank of you. that site. Okay, um, Mr. Richardson, has your question been answered, sir? It's been answered, but I'm not satisfied. Can we move to Mr. Rice? Okay. Mr. Rice. Um, there are other areas in town with different zoning categories that allow counseling. Is that a correct statement? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, AD, in, in the lawyer here used uh, ADA as the reason why you need to remove this. And maybe it's just simplistic. The way I look at that ADA also governs parking spaces and you're required to have so many parking spaces ADA doesn't mean that you have to have all parking spaces ADA. So as long as we're providing areas within town to have counseling, I think it can restrict counseling in certain zoning categories. You're not prohibiting it throughout the city. I mean, is that too simple of an analysis? The ordinance as drafted on its face is discriminatory by not allowing new counseling facilities. It, what the current code says is that counseling facilities are only allowed to be there if they're pre-existing and they're not allowed to expand. The, the, they're a valid non-conforming pre-existing use. And so for a new business to want to come to that area, they would be prohibited because of the zoning code that would be determined. It could arguably be discriminatory and that's the fight we're trying to avoid because there's reason that my office tends to agree that it may be discriminatory and it would be an uphill battle to defend. Even though we're allowing defend. it in different areas of the town with the proper zone. That's correct. Because okay. they're looking at this particular site. I think, though, Mr. Richardson still has a question because he's saying that counseling is being offered in this district anyway. Is so, that true, Mr. Richardson? So the code is called non-conforming uses, and it's talking about the exist. It says the existing social services are allowed, but you can't expand. And so if there's something there that was one of the non-conforming uses, the code allows it, but it's saying that these non-conforming uses can't expand and no new businesses can come in, and that's what we're changing. Is it, so as I read this, then it's saying that those that are there now who are providing not only counseling services, but food provisions, emergency and short-term housing services, and employment services, and so on and so on. So those companies that are, there, that are there now that are conducting this business can continue to do so. But if a, but if a new company wanted to come in, they are prohibited. Correct. Okay, so with that being said, we're not only allowing for counseling. Why are we only allowing counseling service to move in? Why not allow all other companies to also move in? This seems to be kind of sort of. So there is a plan that was that resulted in the IRCN zoning code. And that plan specifically asked the people that lived in the neighborhood what they wanted to see and how they wanted to tailor their neighborhood and zoning code, which is what resulted in 28-21, which established non-conforming uses that they did not want to expand. That's how this code was created. And one of the things listed in the non-conforming uses that are not allowed to expand is counseling. And we have now since decided, based on the current situation, that eliminating only that one 
type of use of counseling as in the list of non-conforming uses would get us out of this potential litigation where those other things are not in the same category putting us into potential litigation. And if the community that lived there and created the IRCN plan wanted to change the plan that they had put in place, then we would look at revising the other things in the list. But the only reason we're looking at this is because of the letter that's included in this agenda item. Let's recognize Mr. Atom, please. So just so I'm clear, because I, I, I agree with Mr. Richardson that it could, we're actually allowing counseling by striking that. And we're not disallowing counseling by striking it. We're allowing counseling by striking it. That's correct. And it wasn't anticipated at the time they put the original zoning in place that it potentially um, went against disabilities or um, other things. So it, it was an oversight back then that probably shouldn't have been part of the code and we're correcting that. Is that an correct accurate? analysis? Recognize Mrs. Riley, please. Uh, I was just going to say the same thing as you did, uh, Member Aton, that it's an expansion of counseling, not a retraction. And it, the fact that it doesn't address all those other things, I, I'm not sure that's what we're here to look at tonight. I think we're just here to look at that one modification. Mr. Faison, do you want to add any comments to that? My biggest concern with this is I believe this should be a rezoning topic and not a, not a, a strike of one word of counseling. And I understand that we are trying to avoid litigation, but what we're allowing in this particular case here is to still prevent the, the growth, if you will, of those other items, such as food provisioning, emergency, and short-term housing, as an example. And so to just avoid litigation, we're going to just simply strike out the word counseling to allow counseling services to be expanded, but none of the other items. And if it were the way that I see this is, this should be really a rezoning issue all the way together to not limit the expansion of more businesses. Um, and, and, but in this case here, like you said, we're only here to look at just counseling, but I, I believe that, that there is a, a restriction of growth in that area by virtue of this zoning requirement. That's all. Any additional comment? Oh, Mr. Rice. I think you have an excellent point, Member Faison, and it's sort of like we're, we're fixing a problem with counseling, not trying to be you know, discriminatory, but all these other things, we're going to remain discriminatory. But, but that's what zoning is. It's discriminatory against a lot of things throughout the city because that's why you have zoning. You're allowed to use this use here and this one here, but there's always a zoning category somewhere you can have industrial. It doesn't mean every site can be industrial, but it's not discriminatory because you're allowed to have it throughout the city, somewhere in the city. It's still an allowable use within the city limits of Titusville. And that's where I'm hung up because I think we are being discriminatory against all those other items here. I think, I think your point is very well taken. I, I hear you, and I think that the, pro, the distinction between counseling and the other items listed is that counseling does implicate a group of people that are a class within the ADA where the others do not have that same type of implication of a class of people affected. I think there's a little bit of discrimination in this. In fact, I think there's a lot of discrimination in the wording of this. I believe the word is monopoly. If I, if I could say so, the word is monopoly. This, to me, seems like this code was written for a particular agency, if you will. And it prevents anybody else from coming to that area. Um, by striking this particular code out, it promotes growth and competition in that very same area. But if we leave it in place, only one company that's there now continue to, to operate without any competition. And that's my, that's my take on this. Chairwoman, could I address that and also offer a potential solution? So, Please. Uh, thank you. 
With regards to monopoly, I think more so the condition currently acts as a monopoly because the existing um, establishments are allowed to continue and no one else, whereas you're opening it to future counseling services, not just this one particular counseling service in the future. <clears throat> if the commission's interested in expanding what's allowable in the IRCN, I would recommend and, and put forward to you that you recommend approval of this change tonight so that we can avoid the discrimination lawsuit um, that um, Chelsea has, has done a good job explaining the, the, the purpose for striking that and the, the classes of individuals that can be um, discriminated against and then offer city council um, a recommendation for requesting advisability to look at the uses that are allowable in IRCN and see if there are additional uses that should be allowed that are currently prohibited in IRCN. Uh, C, I R C N C. Well said, Mr. Grant. Yeah, I was going to say well said also, but I, my question was to Mr. Mr. Feist and Mr. Rice. Are you advocating denial of this ordinance? I'm listening to all the arguments, and I I haven't totally made up my mind. But at this point, I, I don't see how we can approve one group but discriminate against another group. I mean, I, I'm struggling with that. But well, I do I, have another question of staff when it's my turn. So It so, is now your turn. So to answer your question, um, the, I understand that we want to, the city wants to avoid litigation mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the cost thereof that's incurred therein. And I agree with that. However, comma, um, furthering this, this just for counseling, what about all the other, all the other issues that, that pertain there? Um, what if a food bank wanted to move in that same area? We have to come right back and redo the same thing again. What if a short-term housing wanted to move in that same area? We have to come right back and do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. So instead of count, just addressing just counseling itself, because it falls under ADA, which I understand that, why not look at the entire, the, 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 the totality of this zoning requirement and, and give it a real good once-over versus just counseling? Well, unfortunately, that's not before us tonight, but what Eddie said makes a little sense. A lot of sense. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how we would go about doing that. Would that, would that have to be a motion, Madam Chairman? Um, let, let's speak with Mr. Richardson first. But yes, I'd, I'd like to go back to staff okay. for advisement. Mr. Richardson. Yeah, my impression of the entire ordinance, if it is an ordinance, it is, was that it was asking to eliminate counseling, but now understand that it's eliminating those items that are not stricken, food provisions, short-term housing, and employment services, and including community residential homes? Yes, that's the existing code. And so if you would recommend that the city council have direct staff to revise this 28-21, to further expand those additional services, that would be a separate motion from this ordinance. And in addition to Eddie's recommendation that you either pass or deny this ordinance, you could of course always table it. And it looks to me that the title of the ordinance is broad enough to resolve other issues within the subsection C, but that's as far as it goes, this particular code ordinance title. Um, it says to amend the definition of social services, which are restricted in the Indian River City Neighborhood Zoning, subsection C, non-conforming uses, like I said, that's currently existing in the code. So I hope that answers your questions. Mr. Rice. Because under the current code, as it stands today, once one of those uses vacated that property, existing use vacated the property, and they were, it was vacant for more than six months, they would lose the right to go back into that property under... That's correct. Okay. I just want to make sure everyone understands that eventually it will weed out every one of these as a business goes out of business and it's vacant for more than six months if we don't do something. Member Aton. So... I, I fully agree that it seems like this this section of code needs to be relooked at, but I I also want to keep in mind our goal here, and I think we we addressed something at, at um, when at the last couple of meetings that we changed the comprehensive plan because we found it was in 
um, there was a property rights issue, and that happened at a state level, and the ADA is at a federal level, and so we've got a section of code here that I think is trumped by a federal or a state regulation, and we're trying to fix that. So I think we need to address that, and I think that's the goal of, of this, but I think absolutely as it relates to what the proper uses are of this zoning district, you know, need to be re-looked at, but because the citizens in that area and a lot of other people have input, it's a bigger issue than we can address you know, right now. I have a question to staff. Is this, and this may be just an, an opinion, would it be better to table this totally for investigation of rewriting? Um, after thinking about that further, if you wanted council to provide direction to staff to go further with it, I don't know that your tabling it would accomplish that. So you probably want to either recommend denial or approval and if you do recommend approval of this change, then also have a second motion regarding additional changes, having staff, a council direct staff to prepare that ordinance. Thank you. So let's call for, our, do we have a motion on the floor? And do we have a second on that motion? We don't, do we? Right. Okay. Let's call for um, a motion, please. I'd like to move. Ms. Raleigh, I'm sorry. I'd like to move that we approve the um, the ordinance as drafted by staff with the uh, deletion of the word counseling. And that's section 28-21, correct? I believe it is. Yes. C. C. Thank you. Okay. Right. Second. Right. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Uh, roll call, please. Oh, yes, it was. Mr. Grant, just a hint. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any additional discussion? I, I, Mr. I, Rice. Is the intent, uh, Member Riley, that you would follow with another motion to, to fix the other? Uh, either I would or you would. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I just don't want to vote one way yeah, if we're not my, going to follow through my thought, with, my with thought the other. My thought was that we would definitely do something about the other situation okay. because after hearing everybody, I, I agree that something should be okay. done about the overall thing. All right. End of discussion. Roll call, please. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? No. Member Rice? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Chairwoman Spido? Yes. Passes. Member Riley. And um, I'd now like to make a motion that we uh, refer this particular section uh, back to City Council uh, with the request to have it uh, reviewed in terms of all of the different um, uh, provisions in that 2821C uh, be looked at as to whether or not uh, we're creating a monopoly or uh, we're creating more discrimination in, in, in Titusville ordinances. I'll second that motion. Discussion. I'd like to add in the discussion and question to council. Should that be referred to staff or be referred to council? and then council refers it to staff. So what your, what your recommendation would be tonight is to recommend to city council to give advisability to staff. Yes, can you add that, that provision, please? Yes. Thank you, okay. Any additional discussion? Um, Mr. Anton. So this might be opening a can of worms, but <laughs> we're looking at one very, one zoning category. I, I got to believe that there's probably similar language in some other zoning categories other than just as Indian River City neighborhood that do we want to broaden this that it looks for discriminatory language like this across all of the city zoning categories instead of limiting it to the IRCN category. 
my, I, I, <laughs> I know it's quite a project probably. My um, personal take on this is that the IRCN is a unique um, zoning category that is unlike any other in the city. Um, the resolution 8-2012 adopted the Indian River City Neighborhood Plan. Um, there are some other neighborhood plans, but I don't think that any others resulted in zoning categories as specific as this in our city. Um, I see Eddie shaking his head. I think he agrees with me. Um, the city of Titusville adopted the Indian River City Neighborhood Plan as a revitalization strategy for the neighborhood plan area. And so it's very specific to this little part of town. And again, I don't think that there's anything else like it. And I was reading in the code as Woody was talking, and there's a sentence that I thought you might be interested in. Um, it Under 28-21, that's the whole Indian River City neighborhood zoning category. There are several subsections, but subsection A says, within the purpose of intent, the last sentence reads, the regulations are intended to provide for a compatible buffering between commercial and residential areas, as well as to phase out incompatible uses in the core residential area that have negatively impacted the neighborhood over time. So that's the background of the purpose for this particular zoning. Hey, counseling was identified as one of them. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I wasn't on the mic. I'll call for the end of discussion. Ms. Riley, do you need to restate your motion, please? Or is everyone clear on Ms. Riley's? Okay, roll call, please. Member Porter? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Member Rice? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Secretary Grant? Yes. Chairwoman Spido? Yes. Moving on to Item 9C, CUP number 7 2021, Swan Storage. Thank you, Chairwoman, and good evening, Commissioners. I knew you, you were wondering when you'd get to hear from me. Um, we waited. <laughs> Um, so this item is uh, begins on page 67 of 132. This is CUP number 7, 2021, and I'll read the, uh, the summary explanation. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to operate a mini warehouse use on a vacant, unaddressed parcel located on State Road 405 South Street between South Park Avenue and Kilmarnock uh, Lane. Parcel ID 223517AV star 81. The applicant also proposes to establish an outdoor storage use. The city's land development regulations require a conditional use permit for the mini warehouse use. The outdoor storage use is a permitted use with limitations for properties designated as industrial on the future land use map. The future land use designation on the property is industrial. In 2016, the city adopted the South Street Small Area Plan to provide a strategic vision for the orderly growth and development of the central segment of State Road 405 from Singleton Avenue to State Road 50. The subject property is within the South Street small area plan boundary. The applicant proposes to construct five new buildings and 55 outdoor storage spaces for the storage of recreational vehicles at the site. The applicant proposes a total of 46 storage units with two different sizes, 36 units that'll be 10 by 10, 12 units that are 10 by 15. Office space will be provided within the 1500 square foot building nearest the South property line. Each building is proposed to be one story tall each, and the total size of all five buildings is 6,650 square feet. The staff is recommending approval of the CUP with two conditions. The first is an opaque vegetative screen at least six feet in height at the time of planting shall be provided along the eastern edge of the east canopy between the canopy and the stormwater system. And the second is the proposed locations of the building shall remain as shown on the concept plan when submitting the site development permit application or otherwise provide sufficient screening consistent with section 30-339 where the buildings will no longer provide a screen. Uh, I think we have a presentation. So I'm... We're up in the podium. Oh, thanks.
Technology. Our friend. <laughs> there we go. So on the left-hand side of the zoning map, you can see uh, M1 south of the property, M2 west of the property, and GU and OR to the east of the property. And so the, the picture on the right-hand side is an image from the South Street Small Area Plan that generally distinguishes what um, uses are appropriate within the, the South Street Small Area Plan area. The uh, property is along the eastern edge of State Road 405, so it's in that magenta color, and it's between the purple, which is in, uh, heavy industrial, and the yellow, which is residential. Just a summary, the zoning on the property is M1. It's currently vacant, and the proposed use is a mini warehouse with RV storage. So the conditional use permit is for the mini warehouse use. The outdoor storage use is a permitted use with limitations. The first condition, um, if you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a row of RV storage spaces and the long vertical lines are the, uh, the edges of the, the stormwater system. So between the stormwater system and those RV spaces, that canopy that's gonna be on the east side of the property, um, that's where the request, the, the condition of a six foot high vegetated screen would be located to help buffer from the two residential properties east of the subject property. And the second condition, if you notice along uh, State Road 405, if you were driving north or south, uh, those proposed buildings provide a, uh, they act as a screen, the walls um, from the outdoor storage space. And so that's where the second condition comes in where if during the site plan uh, application, pro site development permit application process, if some of the buildings were shifted, if you approve the use tonight, but some of the buildings are shifted, it may, those buildings would not, um, the areas where the buildings are moved from would no longer be screened with those buildings. And so we would request that screening be provided where the buildings are no longer providing that screening. And that's it for the short presentation. Are there, are there cards on this item? Yes, Brent Swanson. Welcome, Mr. Swanson. Yeah. Good evening, commission members. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Brent Swanson, 25 year plus Titus Hill resident. Um, we were in agreement with staff's recommendation. A few months ago, we started on this project and we scheduled a pre-planning meeting with staff and we've gone along with their recommendations and just wanted to introduce ourselves and hopefully provide something to the community that is an asset uh, down the road. Any questions? I have a question. Do you have a Approximately how many recreational vehicles can be parked in this uh, storage area? Right now we're estimating around 55, but I mean that number could go to 60 or 65. It's just how many you can get in there. I mean, we're planning on uh, allowing 12 foot bays for the vehicles to park in, which is adequate. And these are basically for um, snowbirds who who keep their recreational vehicles here Correct. during this season or off season, and then they come and pick them up and as well as compliance for the city. So in, in the order of a boat or RV that uh, needs a place for, you know, storage or long-term storage, that's where we would be locating. Members, what kind of questions do you have? Ms. Riley. Uh, um, Mr. Swan Swanson? Correct. Uh, all right, so on the western border of the property that goes along South Street, there is a section between your yellow line and the road. Uh, do you, you own that property, or is that the right of way? No, no, we do not own that. That's the, that's the uh, State Road 405 corridor expansion right away. Okay, so you can't do anything with that property anyway. No. When you build this, will 
will there be will trees remain in that area that I'm pointing absolutely. at? Absolutely, absolutely. So there'd that, be nobody be, to cut them down. That'll be undisturbed. It's not our property to disturb. So nothing will go outside. Right. Of right. Well, I know we're not here to talk about trees tonight, but I, you know, living here so many years, traveling South Street very often, a beautiful array of trees on both sides of the, the road is just something that you, you can't give money for. It's just right. something quality of life. Um, OK, but so but there'd be 30 feet in between where you own and where you'd be building these buildings. Absolutely. That's the 30 foot landscape buffer that would remain in place. Okay, and the vegetative screen, my understanding, would be over on the east side. Correct. There's also a 25-foot landscape buffer there that would remain in place, and as well as a 75-foot, approximately 75-foot retention area before you would get to the 25-foot landscape buffer. Where's the bat landscape buffer? On the landscape buffer is on the, um, all, all around the property. There's a 20-foot buffer that's on both the north and south sides. On the east side, there's a 20-foot buffer, and there's a 30-foot buffer that is on the uh, west side that borders 405. Okay, my understanding is the only residence is something off to the east? Correct. How, and it's 100 feet away? No, they're probably from property line. Their nearest building is around 300 feet. Okay. And then there would be a 20-foot landscape buffer on our end, and then there would be approximately a 75-foot retention area, dry retention area before you would get to any of the RV spaces. So. Okay, so be probably even if you did operate 24 seven, you wouldn't be affecting any local residents? Not that we're aware of. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Member Faison. For your outdoor storage, will, they be, will there be any uh, canopy? Correct. The, um, the, naturally the 10 by 10 and the 10 by 15 Many storages are covered. Those are, you know, completely enclosed. And then what we're proposing is the uh, outdoor stair storage area would all be under canopy. Thank you. Member Aton. Is the landscape buffer, is that disturbed or is it just left like it is now? It's left natural okay. now. So, so if there's we, trees there, those trees stay. Trees stay, okay. yeah. We're not going in and removing anything out of there. Uh, yes, Mr. Rice. I don't know if my question is for you. It might be for the engineer. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. You, to but... add, uh, CCEI is our engineer, and yeah. uh, they're with us this evening. So, I, I guess my, my question really is, in staff, you might be able to. When I look at at the existing conditions plan, internal to the site, outside the buffers. I see 28-inch oak, 22-inch oak, 33-inch oak, 24. I mean, there's a lot of oaks internal to this site. You know, we just passed a new tree ordinance. It's pretty tough. And have you evaluated this site and your layout based on that tree ordinance? Because there's limitations on the amount of impervious surface you can have in the root zone on the site. So how are you going to address those through site plan? Right. Inter uh, introduce yourself for the record, yeah, please. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon, you. staff. Good afternoon, members. My name is Stavros Sajustavridis. I'm with Consulting Civil Engineers. We're right off of uh, 3650 Bobby Lane. We're literally right across the street from this site. Uh, to address the, um, with every project, we always consider existing conditions. We always consider large uh, caliper trees, especially the heritage trees that you're talking about. We, uh, we have uh, done the best that we can to massage the site to conform to the existing trees that are that are there. Um, if you uh, take a look at the exhibit, you'll notice that on the south side, there, most of it is green. So the green is representing um, grassed area. Uh, the lighter shade of green is representing the dry retention pond. That would be the area that would be disturbed the most. But most of the perimeter of the site is going to re remain uh, undisturbed. It's going to remain its natural condition. The vegetative buffer along the um, east and west side is going to remain undisturbed. Uh, towards the south area where you have the larger green portion, um, that area was left green because we found a lot of the large caliper trees in that area of the site. Um, obviously, uh, we, do, we do our best, but to meet our clients' needs, we have a certain um, amount of space to work with. So we're going to dis we're going to be disturbing trees. We just try to avoid the large ones the best we can. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I understand the process pretty well, but but internal to your site where the parking is, there's a cluster of trees, 24, 33, 20, uh, another 20, another 24, and there are several that are probably not going to survive based on your current site plan. I just, I know staff's going to have, I mean, you have to go through site plans, so I know staff will do and follow the ordinance to the letter of the law, I'm sure, uh, but I'm just cautioning you. Be careful because I, I think you're it's going to be challenging in terms of your site in some spots you, you might have to open up some areas for the tree canopy and not park RVs there is all I'm saying is, all right. is based on that because you're gonna find that the new ordinance is a little tougher okay yeah well hopefully everyone will consider the amount of vegetation that were that will remain untouched as existing canopy uh, natural vegetation no new planting um, it, keeping everything natural along the perimeter. But there's internal, there's some internal area canopies that are required in terms of the sites, not, you know, in the, in, before we could do just perimeter, uh, those days are gone. Okay. Okay, so I just want Definitely you to be aware of that. Take that in consideration. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a comment. I think it was over a year ago, and it was, um, a proposal of a development, and there was a wildlife study. I've observed in that area um, bobcats and uh, lots of other interesting wildlife. Residents from that area that were against a proposed development, I think more east of here or a little bit south of here, also testified of observations of extra a, a, gr a great deal of um, wildlife that we'd like to preserve is it staff is there a required survey of wildlife for this particular proposal with the site plan requirements uh, not specific to wildlife although you could make a recommendation that a wildlife um, survey if you feel like this area requires an additional um, look at specific to wildlife um, you could recommend to council to add a wildlife survey to uh, the conditions of approval and do I do that with a proposal? Oh, with a motion. As a condition? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there was just an awful lot of testimony. and I've personally observed several um, uh, bobcats in this area. We travel 405 quite frequently, and, so, and also um, a birding population. So I'm concerned about those two things. Gentlemen, any additional information? Mr. Swanson, no? Okay, thank you. Discussion from the board? Madam Chair. Mr. Grant? I, I, I noticed the subject property is, uh, it intrudes upon some wetlands. Will a permit be, uh, would that be, um, no, I'm going to say this here now. Will those, the wetlands, will they be filled in as part of the subject property? Do you know, staff? I would defer to the to the applicant, but I, um, I don't see where, where did you see that there were wetlands on the side? Right here. Um, page, page I don't know what page it is, but. Um, uh, the, the area in question, I think you're referring to the uh, southeast corner. It, yeah, okay. Uh, bottom right corner, I believe right. on your page. Right. Uh, that area is going to remain untouched. Okay, all right. Uh, so. there's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a currently there's a, a, I wouldn't say a tributary, but there's a conveyance swale in the area, which is probably why it's uh, uh, marked as a wetland area. But that'll be the portion of the area that we were discussing before that would be remain untouched. Okay, very good, because we have a, uh, we, we get excited when you start filling in wetlands around right. here. Okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Richardson. I would just ask, add gopher tortoises to that list. Okay. Would that be included in a wildlife study, sir? Absolutely. They're an endangered species. Any additional comments? Mr. Rice. I just want to share with 
my fellow commissioner, uh, wildlife study on a project like is is pretty common. They always get environmental scientists to walk the site and make sure there's no gopher tortoises, scrub jays, indigo snakes, all those type of things, because you need to share that with St. John's, you need to share it with the city, and all that stuff will be in the in the site plan process. And, and I'm sure these guys will do the same thing that most engineers do. Right. So. It, it'll be part of the environmental scientist's report. So it does not have to be conditional to this. Okay, I'm getting a conflict. Okay, so I think I misspoke, so let me clarify. Okay. A wildlife survey is not required as part of the conditional use permit, which is what you're reviewing tonight. But once the use is, is approved through the CUP process, they have to apply for the site development permit to construct the site, which involves a stormwater system, um, grading. And so during that process, a wildlife survey is required, wildlife information is required. And we see that, is that correct? No, ma'am. So this- We like, do not see that? Mm -mm. So what about these bobcats? <laughs> so, staff would review the information um if you're asking f how you can be um, made aware of the information um, you can always request the information from our office you know everything we receive is public record um, but as far as bringing it back to the commission um, after the cup process everything else is administrative through uh, the city staff okay additional comments call for a proposal madam chairman i mr grant i'd like to make a motion please please do i'll make a motion that we approve um conditional use permit 7-2021 swanson storage with conditions as stated by staff do i have a second second roll call vote please or further discussion excuse me Now, Clerk. Member Aton? Yes. Member Rice? Yes. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Chairwoman Spido? Yes. Thank you very much. Members, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next proposal 9D REC number 2 2021 3413 South Hopkins Avenue. Staff, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I can read the summary application, the summary explanation for this item, uh, but I did want to make you aware that the applicant has requested that the commission table this item. Um, they, we sent them the staff report, which included a recommendation for denial, and they requested a continuance to be able to work with staff and understand the, the concerns. Um, so I, if you would like me to, I can read the summary explanation, or we can um, get straight to the tabling. Do they have a date? Uh, they have, no, not, not formally. Uh, they, are, they have so far proposed the December uh, PNC meeting, there's only one, and then the first meeting of uh, there's only one as well in uh, December for city council, the first reading, and then the public hearing date um, would be that first city council meeting in January. But they're not, uh, it's not set in stone yet, so I didn't want to um, give you those dates and give you the expectation that that is when it will be heard. But, uh, so staff is suggesting that we st we table this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Member Grant. Uh, Mr. Richardson was up first. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I Mr. make Richardson. a motion that we table this item until staff has the opportunity to work it out with the uh, applicant. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? How long will oh, this be? Oh, excuse me. Okay, thanks. There's no discussion. Technically. Never mind the discussion. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to ask my question then. Thank you. Let's say you track the motion temporarily where you can ask your question. Do we want to do that? No. Okay. No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Roll call, please. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Rice? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Chairwoman Spido? Yes. Okay. We're at the City Council Summary of Action Report. Staff, do you have any comments, please? 
I'm sorry, is this general reports or just specific to that? Whatever. Because um, I just wanted to, uh, again, mention those business cards that I handed out. That's the city's sustainability action plan. So we're currently open right now for public comment, uh, what priorities you feel are important. So we definitely want to hear from our PNZ members. There's a website with a survey and a um, message board where you can post ideas. It's kind of a fun new way of providing public input. So we'd really like you to take a look at it and share with your friends and neighbors um, so we can get some really good input and have a well-rounded uh, sustainability plan. Did not we do this before? I'm sorry? Didn't we do this before with Brad? Uh, no, ma'am. We did something like this, didn't we? Yeah, but that it was a Titusville tomorrow, something else. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is something totally different. Go on this website. It is. So, Rachel Muller is our new sustainability planner, and um, she's spearheading the project. And we've got the uh, consultant, SNME, that's helping us with the project. And uh, there's going to be a meeting, I want to say it's December 9th, but check the website just to be sure. Um, and also, I'll mention about the uh, elevator. So, the City Hall elevator is going to be under repair from November 15th to the end of the year. And so all future meetings will be at the uh, fire multi-purpose room until the repairs on the elevator are completed. Will you be emailing us or the clerk be meeting, reminding us that of that, please? Sure. Okay, and there's a serviceable elevator at the fire department right there, across the street? There is. Okay, thank you. Eddie, do you have a time on this meeting on December 9th? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Does that include Brad's um, pre-meeting training also? Yeah, that's going on forever. Um, I actually emailed Brad about that. He was going to look and see whether or not he was going to be able to accommodate the 5 o'clock on the 17th. I okay. had suggested that they be canceled, but I don't know if he was able to work it out that the training could be coordinated or not. So you'll get an email about that. Um, as well as the notice on the agendas will state the meeting room is in the fire multipurpose room, which is across the street, second floor. Does any member of the panel have a, have a report or concern, please? Nope. Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to say that um, I apologize for my absences uh, during the other meetings and um, I had some uh, personal issues and some uh, business. I started a new business and um, and I lost my uh, my youngest nephew and uh, this uh, this you know it's probably not really germane to this body but um, if you have uh, if you have a gun and you have children in the house please keep it locked up and uh, uh, it wasn't an accident but it's still could have prevented something but um uh but thank you for uh for uh for accepting me back in and uh i'll be making my case to the city council to stay on so but thank you our only concern is that we missed you sir <laughs> please communicate with us yeah sorry please accept our our deepest sympathies and also our concern for you and your family thank you okay that's why we're here for the city and for you Okay, thank you. Any additional comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, as Mr. Childs has stated there and pursuant to the chairwoman's request at the last meeting for an attendance record, I reviewed the attendance record and I've prepared a memorandum that I'm hoping Chairwoman Spidell will sign at the conclusion of this meeting saying the summary of the meetings missed and um, noting that Mr. Childs requests to continue serving on the commission. And so after the signature, this item will go on the council agenda along with the attendance record and Mr. Childs request directed at council to excuse his absences. So it would be appropriate for a motion from the commission to approve the memo, um, excusing the absences and asking the chairwoman to sign it. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much, Council. Did we get that memo? No. Oh. Nope. I just was looking at my attendance. <laughs> we are looking at your attendance each week, Mr. Rice. It's it's included. It's included? Can you share email it to us for us? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Charles, we care about you. 
Thank Just you. keep in touch. I, I know. Okay? I apologize for That's not That's why we check your attendance. Yeah, I know. When, you. when we call the house and nobody's there, see, we care. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Counselor. Um, I'm going to call for adjournment. I would like to ask the security to please prepare some interlude music, some performance, <laughs> you know, something for these technological breakdowns. Okay? And Eddie, yeah. the next time we're in an extended break, you should bring something from Publix for us to stank yeah. on. Oh, yes, Eddie, could you? you know, evidently, you've been seen shopping at our neighborhood. King at Publix. That is a joke. Thanks for watching the Titusville Planning and Zoning Commission meeting.